Hello and welcome to this online service from Christchurch in Southport. Uh, my name's Beck, I'm the curate here. It's great to have you joining us as we continue our sermon series looking at the missional life. And today we're going to be hearing from Tabs talking to us about conversation. So let's go over and hear what he's got to say. Today's reading is the first nine verses of Luke 10, followed by one verse from 1 Peter 3, verse 15. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And moving on. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This is the word of the Lord. Morning all. I, uh, I wanted to start with a, uh, a prayer um, that flashed up on the um, Lectio 365 daily devotions from 24-7 prayer. You know when something just pops up and it just confirms everything and it just kind of fits beautifully. Uh, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, you told us to ask the Father to send out workers to bring in the harvest. This we must do. Please ignite a renewed passion for the gospel in our lives and a sense of urgency in our churches. May we preach the way of salvation clearly today so that many might see and believe and put their trust in you. Mobilise us as a missionary movement wherever we live and to every tribe and tongue. Holy Spirit, Revive us again. Come to us once more as you came to that first prayer room in Jerusalem that we might be propelled out of our meetings and onto the streets with new courage to preach the gospel. That thousands might encounter the resurrected Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's been a little while since I've uh, preached at Christchurch. Uh, it's always a privilege. Um, and this question I'm going to start with is by no means a reflection on those who get to preach more often than I do. Um, but it's, it's this question that I'd like you to think about. Have you ever met someone who's tried to explain something to you that they have clearly put a lot of thought into understanding for themselves but absolutely zero thought into how to explain it to someone else. 
I can see a few nodding heads. That's good. I'm not the only one. Uh, in a previous life, uh, I studied, at, uh, studied engineering at a university renowned for its engineering research, um, but also renowned for being awful at its teaching. Uh, I had a tutor in my final year who, um, he was great, one of the greatest minds in acoustic engineering, I, I thought. Um, and whenever I went to sit in his room and he'd, he'd talk to me, uh, he'd, he'd waffle on about all sorts of stuff that I didn't understand. Um, and then he'd, get, he'd come to a point halfway through a sentence where his mind would just go blank and he'd forget what he was saying and he'd struggle to find the right word. And it was usually, it was usually a, a really simple word like wall or brick. And um, you knew exactly what word he was going to say and you were like, is it rude if I like, step in and suggest the next word for this incredibly intelligent man who's not thought at all how he's going to explain things to me? And then a few, a few years later, a uh, slightly different line of work, um, ended up uh, working with international mission gap year students, many of whom I absolutely took my hat off because English wasn't their first language. But they were in our country working with children and young people. And they had this, they had this little habit that uh, they, would, they would pull out whenever they couldn't think of the word in a sentence, they would replace it with like a non-specific term, like thing or stuff or, uh, or some sort of pronoun. So I'd walk into the office and I'd be like, oh, Tabs, Thingy has emailed about the thing on Wednesday that we need to take that stuff to. Uh, she said if we drop it off with him at uh, um, five o'clock, um, then it'll all be fine. I knew, by the end of it, I knew exactly what they meant. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I guess I've had a fair amount of practice at working out what people mean and guessing what they're actually talking about after all these years, or at least I thought I did, uh, because then I got a wife. <laughs> and I'm not allowed to say any more on that subject. <laughs> this is the fourth week in our sermon series, and we have the rather practical uh, theme of conversation today. We have talked about the love of God as our motive for mission. Then we've talked about our identity as living missionally rather than just doing uh, mission. We've talked about what our message is and getting to grips with understanding fully for ourselves the story of the gospel, God's salvation plan for our lives and the lives of those around us. So how we explain that in a way that people that we want to reach are actually going to understand, how do we do that? Thinking practically here this week, how do we put our message across in a way where people are actually going to get it? How do we put it across in a way that is relevant to the person we're talking to? It may not seem like it um, but at, at from first glance, but the, the verse that I chose, well, I didn't choose, it was part of our missional life course um, for, uh, at, in that one, yeah, in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it might not seem like it at first glance that it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to have a conversation with a non-Christian, um, but when you look deeper into it, I think it really is. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's the first thing, revering Christ as Lord. That means to submit to God as Lord, where everything in our lives lines up with what it means to follow him. And not just the external stuff, but our inner self, where everything is lined up to God's lordship. We have what a lot of people call an ordered soul. A secular society might think it has everything that a person needs. But I don't know about you, but I really don't believe it does. It leaves out a huge missing piece. The soul. The ordered soul. And there comes a point when people realise that. Mark 8, Jesus says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Regardless of those rose-tinted views of the past, 
or uh, the false veneer that people present themselves with on social media, everyone struggles at some point. Whether that's with pain, disillusionment, heartache, deeper longings, whatever it might be, research would suggest uh, that there's a particular point in someone's life when they are most open to a conversation around faith. Can you guess when that might be? It's when they're at that point of personal crisis or when they're encountering a situation of, of wider crisis in society. A pandemic, for instance. Don't know whether you've experienced one of them recently. Or, uh, or global conflict and warfare, like we're seeing right now. The, past, uh, the verse moves on, Peter moves on to say, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. When our lives touch the lives of others, uh, the hope that we have in our hearts from having a, a soul that reveres Christ is made visible and people notice it's almost like that hope provokes a response. It's a provocative hope that we have within us as Christ followers. A couple of uh, weeks ago, Pat uh, shared her testimony, her story of how she came to know Jesus. And she said the, the real defining point for her was when she noticed people who had something that she didn't have, and she wanted it. She wanted that hope. A bit of context to this particular verse, it's in Peter's first letter, which he wrote to scattered Christians who had been, who were persecuted in the first century, and they'd been scattered across Asia Minor. And so they knew what suffering in crisis meant. They were probably experiencing it firsthand whilst reading this letter. And also, they, they were in a place where they had this fresh opportunity to share the gospel, to share the good news, to show their hope to a foreign land. So I think there's very definitely a place for missional conversations today. People are looking, people are in need, people are searching, uh, the time is right. People are in need of these conversations, but I don't know about you, but it feels like there's kind of a disconnect. It feels like there's almost a gap between where we are and where they are. A gap in our understanding where we're at this point where we've been trying to work out and fully understand everything that's going on and understand our message but they're in this place where they're further away from that understanding that we perhaps realise they are. How do we practically get from the point of understanding our message clearly and living out our missional identity to the point of having conversations about Jesus with the people we meet and do life with? Because statistics would show that the people here their reflection of their experience of faith in society is, um, is quite limited. See, it depends what generation you're working with or you're talking to, uh, but in the UK, we live in a culture where there's all sorts of different stats thrown around, and they tend to vary a little bit, and I can't quite keep up with um, what is what, but around 50% of people seem to not identify as religious or identify as Christian in any way. According to the Talking Jesus research in 2015, 67% uh, of people um, would say they know a Christian, which means that 33% aren't aware that they do. National church attendance back then in that survey was around 10% of people engaging in church worship. I would guess that with the state of decline and the pandemic, it's probably a lot less than that now. I work with children and young people, and Scripture Union, who I partner with, um, they reckon, a few years ago at least, um, that 95% of children and young people have no engagement with church 
whatsoever. More recent unpublished research says it's actually more like 97% now. So chances are the prior understanding and experience of the Christian faith in those we might be talking to, those we might be missional with, is going to be very limited. That might be a positive, though. I often um, find that young people that I'm talking with have much, far less misconceived ideas and, um, and a fresh desire to find out more because it's such a new thing that they, they haven't really thought about. And so this is why Peter says that we, A, share our hope, but B, do this with gentleness and respect. The Apostle Paul does this too. We see it in Acts that whenever Paul uh, travels further away from Jerusalem, travels further away from a, uh, a shared understanding of the scriptures amongst the culture, the, the further back he starts, the more general he starts in his approach to teaching and mission. I uh, am very privileged that I get to work with children and young people um, as a Christian youth worker. And I don't just do that with the 3% of children and young people that, that are in churches. We get to go to where people are at. And we find the starting point and journey with them from there. We create safe spaces to explore the big issues of life and faith. And we used to do this hidden away in a classroom, expecting children and young people to come to us. Sound familiar? But then the pandemic forced us outside. We had this donation of a gazebo, um, which the way that being outside, in the space of young people, in their yard at school, in the communal space where they actually all are, has really revolutionised what we do. Every week, I get back-to-back -back conversations with children and young people, with literally hundreds of young people queuing up to talk to us because they see something of that provocative hope in our lives. The, place, the starting place might be way, way back from where we'd like it to be, and a lot of our conversations are very much entry level, talking about how they're doing their well-being and building those relationships with them. But we've found that place where they are and we start with them and journey from that point. How do we find out where someone is at? How do we find their starting place? We've got statistics. We've got research, we've got generational trends, and I like all that stuff, I'm quite boring, so we could sit down for hours and talk about it all. But really, the thing that we need to do to work out where someone's at in terms of their awareness and experience of God is this. We listen to them. We listen to them and we listen to the Holy Spirit. When Jesus sent out the 72 into the world, he told them to find the people that are responding and, and talking back. Listen to them. Stay with them. Not just so they could have a bit of food, but so they could build that relationship. Invest time into them. And listen. Jesus did this himself in ways that caused quite a bit of friction. Like when he went and stayed and listened at the house of a tax collector. That caused a bit of a, an issue for the Pharisees. But he said to the angry Pharisees, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it is the sick. If we want to uh, have a, a nice tool that our missional, community, our missional life course is uh, provided for us, if we're trying to discern where someone is at in terms of their awareness of God, um, this week, missional communities are going to be looking at something called the Engel Scale. 
uh, which was de developed by a missionary called James Engel. Um, and it has this scale of where people might be at in terms of their awareness of God um, in order to help us find our starting point in communicating the gospel relative to where they're at. Um, but I find that, I don't know about you, I find that far too much to remember. Um, and so I like to use four words that kind of summarize that up a bit. And those are connect, explore, respond, and grow. Now, I cannot take credit from these four words. Um, they are from, Mishnal, uh, they're from Scripture Union, um, and they're part of the Revealing Jesus framework, which if you really want to do some thought into this, you can go check that out online. Um, but for me, they kind of sum up that, that scale, um, but they also follow the flow of Jesus sending out the 72. You see, as Jesus sends out the 72 to connect with those who don't yet have this hope by going to where they are at. He tells them to look for those moments where they might want to explore more of the Christian faith by staying with them, by listening to them, listening to the Holy Spirit's prompting. And then as they stay with them, they, they watch how they respond. Watch how these people respond to that. And if they respond positively, as in they take a step forwards in terms of their personal faith and, and uh, maybe turn their lives round to Jesus, we get to go with them on that journey of growth, discovering for themselves, as we are all still doing, what it means to be reborn into a life of eternal hope and purpose. Connect, explore, respond, and grow. I wonder where the people that you want to talk about your faith to, the people that you're conversing with, I wonder where they're on, where they're at on that scale. And this isn't just a clever communication tools. This, this whole idea of uh, conversations, it's not just about how to explain things well 101. This isn't even just something that we see a few individual stories of Jesus and the apostles doing and going to where people are at. This is actually the whole deal. This is the full story of Jesus. This is the gospel. I may not be, ever be a perfect communicator. A great example of living and growing in Christ I'll, I'll never be the boldest uh, or the most eloquent explainer of the hope I have in Jesus. And that's if I even manage to show it in the first place. But when it comes to finding where people are at, starting there and journeying with them, I want to do it because I know this. Jesus did that for me. God so loved me. God so loved me that he sent his incarnate son, Jesus, to where I was at. To meet me in my brokenness. To gently listen. To understand me. To know my pain and to love me so much that he would know a pain much greater than I would ever experience. To die for me in my place and rise again to bring forth that hope and new life that we have to offer. And we love because he first loved us. Turn to heaven and 
spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living home who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to where my The cross is spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you that you invite us into a journey, a relationship 
of discipleship, of learning and walking with you. And we pray that you would help each one of us to grow in that journey and to walk alongside others, to invite others into that conversation, into that journey of exploration of who you are and how you love us and all that you are calling us to be and to do. We pray that you'd help us each this week to put into action that challenge to conversation with those around us that draws them into relationship with you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been so good to have you with us as we continue on this journey. And um, please do get in touch if you would like to join in with us on this missional life course, or if you would like to know more about what's going on at Christchurch over the coming weeks, then do sign up for our newsletter or um, contact us through our website and we will see you again soon. Bye.